Chris Vinden, Vinden Wines, uh, or is it Headcase Wines? A couple of projects going on there. So we're going to talk about that throughout the course of this conversation. But thank you so much for joining me. I understand you've had a busy day. What have you been up to? Give me a bit of background. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, today with the usual fun things of the post-harvest, clearing your email inbox, um, then straight into post-harvest mode in the vineyard. So we're undervine cultivating, um, and then we're just, just starting to get ready to start sowing some cover crops for I getting the soil ready for next harvest. So doing some cover crops, and then tonight just doing a couple of, sort of ma- I guess, malo rounds, looking at some wines, seeing if they're ready, ready to be wrapped or they're looking where they're at. So I'll give the boys some work to do tomorrow when I'm off to Sydney for a sales trip. So you sort of, a bit of balance. I think it's small business that every day you're doing something different, but I think that's why I know, it's so interesting and I always love what I'm doing, that you're never doing the same thing every day. So, yeah. No, yeah. Just that's, another day. Sounds awesome. Sounds like the good life. And I'm looking at where you are now. You're surrounded by big oak barrels. What's in those? Uh, so we're in the winery, uh, uh, obviously, I uh, thought I'd be polite and uh, my wife's working late tonight as well. So she's probably sick of me um, talking about wine. So I thought I'd come down to the winery, give her some peace and quiet uh, and give you some nice backdrop as well. So I'm uh, in mean, here, this is our barrel room. Um, so it's, sort of, it's quite small. Give us um, a goose. Yeah. Oh, that's good to look at. I, yeah. Obviously no one else can see this, but uh, we've got three large food rooms in the house and pretty much everything is all large format oak, uh, 500 litres um, for food drum. And we've got another room behind in front of me here uh, where it's a like, for a fermentation room. Yep. And it's full of steel and there's also some large concrete stats in there as well. Mm-hmm. So we're sitting in the winery because it's, uh, it's my space, I guess. Um, and it's not often you get it to yourself, so it's nice. Absolutely. Um, So much I want to talk about with you in the time that I've got you. So you may be aware, the listeners would be aware, we're all about stories here. So I want to hear your personal story, how you got into wine, the people that influenced you. I understand you're off the working off the back of a little bit of heritage in the area you are. So I want to talk all about the lineage there, the wine heritage that exists there. But first and foremost, I want to ask you about Young Guns. Um, So Young Guns, it's a program for young winemakers you've had a little bit of success in that area recently so can i can we start by you telling me what is the young guns program for me young guns is about championing younger people coming through the industry if i look at wine it was always an old boys club traditionally and i'm still fighting through those ranks and sort of different ways and i guess that's in a bigger story sort of the idea of the head case and the difference between that and Vinden, but we can get into that later. But the, I think Young Guns is about championing stories of younger people coming up through the ranks. Um, I guess traditionally in wine, you never saw people become a winemaker or a vineyard owner or maybe 20 years ago, even a wine brand until you sort of reach your, about your 40s. And at that point, you had your, your kudos, you've done your stripes on your shirt, so to speak, and you go off and do your own thing. But I think... Young Guns is about, I mean, in every other industry around the world, people often start things a little bit earlier. So I think it's sort of promoting younger stories, um, people having a go at an earlier age, but also being people who are being a little bit more courageous and doing some things that are a little bit outside the norm. We could be playing with different varietals, different winemaking techniques, and these things could have come from different parts of the world, places travelled and other experiences. So I think it's about expanding Australia's, I don't know, breadth of wine but also expanding the age gap which is actually which for a long time was a thing in wine that you sort of were basically a middle-aged man and occasionally a woman like because again there weren't many female winemakers um which is also a shame um for a long period of time so i think it's about championing the youth i.e the winemakers of tomorrow but i think we're Young Gun is going now. It's also very interesting that they're now starting to champion vineyards and i think yeah we've We've entered a couple of times and we've made the top 50 and we've made top 50 vineyards in Australia um, two years in a row, which is for me more exciting than winemaker um, as that's what essentially I am. Uh, I'm a viticulturist and I get to mess around at the winery, play with some booze. Um, but at the end of the day, any winemaker, I think any, any good winemaker will tell you the wine is grown in the vineyard. So that's what we are first as vineyards. So we've got 90 acres of vineyard, 
it's all farmed organically. To my knowledge, only person in New South, well, maybe not in New South Wales, but at least in the Hunter Valley and it surrounds, which is completely herbicide free. So really looking to more regenerative agriculture. And I think that's what Young Gun's pushing as well, more sustainability through the program that they are championing people who are moving away from systemic pesticides and herbicides and other things to promote basically a healthy outlook. Obviously, soil health is important to not only, which is hard to believe, gut health, um, but it's not hard to believe in that same sense that if you grow, if you have healthy soil, you can grow healthy grapes, healthy grapes make better wine. Like it's mm-hmm. a pretty simple philosophy. Like I use this analogy all the time with people in the cellar door. Everyone's had a farmer's market tomato versus one from Woolworths. <laughs> like it's not even a conversation. Yeah. Like yep. if or Coles or Aldi or whatever major supermarket chain of rubbish, flavorless fruit that you're actually buying. Like, like if people, there, there are farmers out there who give a shit and we're one of them. So I think for us, we want to champion our dirt, our terroir, and we're very lucky to farm small vines. So I think mm-hmm. the, I know, it mightn't look as perfect as other places, but we're not looking for pe- perfection in a photo. It's more about a better quality of soil. Yep. Love and character. Um, you've touched on so many things there that I think it would be great to unpack. Uh, you mentioned, so young guns, young, and you also made a reference to female winemakers. I recently had the uh, privilege of talking to Tilly Johnson from the Yarra, who's been doing some yeah, big things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah doing, I just recently got a bunch of her Chardonnay. Absolutely loved it. Love what she's doing so there. We are in the same uh, distribution portfolio. One of my best mates is my distributor, but he's just recently started selling Chili J stuff. So yeah, okay, uh, yeah, very good. Vitti working at Giant Steps. So um, yeah, really nice wines as well. Hundred percent. And what sort of support do young wine my, young wine makers like yourself get through that program? Can you give me a little bit of an inside scoop on how it actually works? More, I guess it's more an award system. Yeah. Uh, okay. What What is it? Um. So you put. Forgetting the overarching idea of what we just spoke about, it's about, I don't know, putting the stories like you are in front of the world and why yep. people of Australia to show people what young people are doing. So um, you will pay a small entry fee to Young Gun to enter state for Young Winemaker of the Year or Vineyard of the Year and you fill out a question and you pay a fee to, obviously there's people working behind the scenes, they shouldn't work for free. Mm-hmm. Um, and they will then collate the wine so if you put some wines up to be judged they then have a review panel um i think it's about 10 people sit down type try the wine and they choose the 50 most exciting producers of that year to for the wines and then the vineyards they do the same thing but obviously very different questions and then rather than having Tim bills in the room they actually get viticulturists who are the head of their fields like liz riley locally um she came visit our vineyard um and they come and assess what you're doing see if you're full of shit or you're telling the truth and what you're actually doing. Um, So in terms of that, that's about as much of the input as we have. It's more of a, uh, I guess, from a winemaking point of view, other things, maybe a bit of a marketing platform, but also a level of recognition from the wider community of what you're doing. And if you're doing something well, congratulations, keep doing it, don't fuck it up kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's so good because there are so many really groovy, awesome things being done um, that maybe I'm saying this on behalf of the younger generation, but I think it's giving young winemakers like yourself and Tilly the platform where you will be more experimental and do those groovy things with the wine um, and just creating awesome drinks and we're benefiting from them on our end. So long may that continue. I want to ask you about the Headcase project. I've got a couple of things I want to tick off the list before jumping into the stories. Um, because you're you're a personality, um, you've got a bit of a persona that I've caught on the front of a wine bottle. So I think <laughs> that was the first first time I came across you. I mean, you've got a bit of a name, um, but saw your face before I actually met you here. Um, and I've heard there's actually something to that. So you're sort of trying to tell a story. I think you're a you're a passionate photographer in your in your spare time. Oh, I used to be when I had time, um, but yep. I think I'm my first holiday booked in about three years um, to Spain in about a month's time. And I'm actually was thinking about it today on the track because I can't wait to actually figure out 
what camera I'm going to take and go start shooting some photos again. I think Instagram is a great little platform to have some fun with it. But yeah, I guess to sort of touch on your young gun question as well, I think it's not only important to look at the young generation, right? the people who have paved the way before you are just as important. That you can't have well, – tradition is tradition not because people just do it for the sake of it, it's because it works. So <laughs> for me – like if you look at the Hunabay's the oldest wine region in Australia or commercial wine region in Australia. Um, there were grapes planted in other places, but they didn't work out. So we're approaching 200 years here. So there are certain styles of wine which work really well. Like no one would argue that Jules make the best semi on on the planet. That is what they do. They have been doing it for, it's one of the founding families of Australian wine for almost 200 years. So for me, the important part of what I do is I don't know, look at that history, build upon it. So the idea of the labels, to get back to your question, is that history is really important in what I do, that we tend old vineyards, uh, we tend new vineyards. Both have similar, the exact same philosophy in farming, but where the wines go is different places. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to understand the rules before you break them. You can't just come out and just do nothing. You sort of kind of have to, I don't know what's pave your own little way. Again, like I was saying before, that most people didn't start doing their own thing till their 40s. So I think there are younger generation that have been working in, vineyard, working in wineries and vineyards. Like for me, it was stage of seven, my first harvest. So um, we've been messing around for a long time. So the idea of the different labels is each of the labels basically embody or are embedded with a different philosophy and ideology behind their winemaking. So... Vin and Wines, which was established as a Vinan estate, because my parents was a smaller hobby farm. They had different careers and they made some wine and had a cellar door. And it was very fun, but it was not sort of, I guess you would call serious business as they didn't do it as their full-time employment. So the way the business sits now, I think almost up to eight, nine, nine years since I took over uh, from a hobby farm. We've gone from, say, 20 tonnes. This year we crushed about 120, which is about where we want to be. It's a nice small size with a small team with our own vineyard. So we produce a small number of wines under the Vinan Wines label, and the wines under that label pay homage to not only my parents, obviously they've laid a legacy before me, but history of the region, but also history of the classic wine styles of the valley. So we make a Semillon, a Chardonnay and a Shiraz under that label. So I think it's really important to keep embodying that. The Semillon's release at five to seven years of age in that classic style. Chardonnay is still me. Um, and the Shiraz is that more classic sort of medium bodied, old school Hunter River Burgundy style. Mm -hmm. Not these big overripe styles, which are trying to mimic other regions, really styles which hone into their own. So the head case label, is essentially my own take on modern Hunter Valley. As I think it's really important to keep maintaining some of those traditional styles. Those styles are tradition because they are great. Um, doesn't mean they're always great, but in the sense that they're great for a reason, but also don't pigeonhole yourself into over acidified semi -on. Like it looks great when it's old, but when it's young, I still don't want to drink it. So with the headcase wines, we make some more progressive um, styles of winemaking. Things are all fermented on solids. Uh, or very minimal intervention, minimal intervention, should I say? Um, bigger oak, more malo, no fining. Most of the wines are not filtered, and then we go into the experimental range, which is what you referenced earlier, which is the photography project. So these are small batch wines, um, which sort of came out of the back of COVID um, part one. I think we're still sort of teetering through it at the moment. It's the only way I describe it. Um, yeah, very painful as a small business um, and very painful uh, as had people have had COVID and all the other impacts. But in terms of the one benefit that came out of the first round for me was that for the first time in sort of pre seven years, I pretty much stopped working seven days a week because I was growing a small business and I had time to smell the roses and I started thinking about things I hadn't been doing for a long time. So I started going, oh, I want to, I picked up a camera again. I put a roll of film in. And I've got about 10 cameras and mix of formats, but I was like, oh, let's just start shooting some cameras. And then this idea sort of came into my head about time and spending time. So we went, why don't we take a photograph of my face and sort of encapsulate this vintage and what it felt like. And so the first vintage is taken about a month after harvest. I, I've had a little bit of sleep, so I don't look like absolute death rolled over, um, which is what this face is at the moment. If you can see it, it's pretty tired. Um, 
But the idea was, yeah, encapsulating those that feeling, that the embodiment of what it was to grow grapes and make wine in that year. And each vintage afterwards, we'll take a new photograph once we've finished harvest, got some sleep, and that photograph will be updated on the label of our experimental wines. But in the longer term, say 30 or 40 years' time, whenever I decide to hang up my Kubra and uh, take off my Red Wings, you'll be able to line up all the bottles and watch me get old. And what will be then hopefully become more interesting is that to look at the experimental wines that I made when I was a 30-year-old as opposed to what I'm doing as a 60-year-old. But the bigger concept of the project is that I guess as you get old, you become complacent. Maybe not complacent, but you get set in your ways. I guess going back to tradition versus experimentation, that the project will enforce me as a human being and as a winemaker that every year I have to think about what I'm doing and hopefully make something new something interesting and something different to what I'd done the previous year. And even up to hopefully I keep going um, and don't get complacent in my ways, but in say 30 years time each year, whether, it, whether it's six wines the last year or four the year before, every year I'll at least do one or two interesting wines that become part of the process of that vintage and the idea of the harvest. So the sort of a long-term project, both I guess of myself in terms of seeing what I make in a long time, but so we all get old so many people keep fighting getting aged like just embrace it like embrace the wrinkles embrace the grays i can't wait to be gray that'd be great <laughs> mate with the akubra i think you'd look you, you look great as a 60 year old you look terrific now but on that point <laughs> it's a battle, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've said though that the the face on the bottle sort of captures the time that was um and i've heard it referred to as sort of a I mean, wine's a time capsule, but that's a very specific time capsule. Capsule, it's capturing you, reflecting, you, you know, the, the the difficulty of that time. I think your face, ex, your facial expression is sort of meant to capture that. How's it been recently? So that was that kicked off in twenty twenty. So you know, twenty was a pretty tough year. Um, forgetting personal things, I at the end of the year was bushfires. So twenty twenty harvest. Yeah. Um, we entered that. So as a small business, the Hunter Valley itself wasn't on fire, but the media had portrayed that the whole of the Hunter Valley was on fire. So we didn't see any customers to our cell at all for about two months. So we're essentially closed. Um, there were horrors that are far worse than the, <laughs> the problem of no customers. But as a small business, um, yeah, it was very stressful. Um, and then from there, obviously, we then dealt with the massive issue, which was smoke tank. So we couldn't make really any serious wines. We made some lovely drink nows and they sold well and I'm really happy with them considering the harvest. We learned a lot of things. Um, and then just as about halfway through, about the first week of COVID, uh, would have been April Fool's, my mentor died, Glendon Howard. Uh, I call him Glenn. He might be angry if I called him Glendon, but um, depends who I'm speaking to. But um, yeah, Glenn passed away. Uh, on April Fool's, which was not exactly a funny joke. Um, and uh, I couldn't even go to his funeral with his family. Um, and in the time since we've bought his vineyard, which was part of, I guess, his will, which is even more ridiculous of the constraints around COVID that we were so close, but I couldn't even get to see him while we were sick because we'd have people come into the cellar door. So while he was ill at home, I couldn't even see him. So it was sort of... 2020 was the culmination of, yeah, pretty hard, challenging season. And the first year we'd grown a bit bigger as well. So we had obligations to Glenn. We bought, it was the first year we took his whole vineyard's fruit. So he'd put his trust in me. He's dropped all his other growers and I was going to take all the fruit for his vineyard for the first time. So there was personal stress. There was friendship. There was a lot of love and loss to Glendon and Rose and can't imagine what they're going through. We're the family, but that first photograph really encapsulates that really shit season. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, but, it sounds it. Yeah. But 2021 was like, we got away with murder. So it's kind of a little bit more relaxed. The size of the bags underneath my eyes aren't quite as big. Um, there's a little wry smile. Everyone's like, you don't look very happy. It's like, look closer. I'll never smile on one of the labels because I think with a photography project, you have to have a series of constants. The facial expressions were to change every year. It's not really consistent. So the constants are will be the same, obviously, profile of shot. 
I'll be wearing a Cooper, the same hat I've been wearing since I was about five. It might be new or old. It all depends on whatever. This is about three days old, the one you're in now. Uh, well, sorry, one you're seeing now. Um, last year was a bit new one. It was depends on the photographs taken, but hopefully, yeah, the photograph just encapsulates the moon. The, I guess the feeling, the moment of what actually happened. So, yeah, that's yeah. terrific. I love that. And um, I, I think off air, I mentioned um, that I heard so many fascinating stories. Uh, involving you in the Fermenting Plays podcast. I definitely recommend people get behind that project. He's doing some great interviews and especially the interview he did with you. um, Absolutely fascinating. Something I picked up there was, I think we were both in the similar position. It could have been on or about 2020. We both had plans to go to Spain and do the Camino, um, but life destined otherwise. Um, So hopefully you can correct me if I've got that wrong, um, but think that was the case and it was very similar for me so hopefully you're still going to do that one day hopefully yeah um but i think that's part of the fun part sort of doing those interviews in COVID. It's like i think at that time of life i was ready to do the camino and i really still want to do it now uh, it was something i always wanted to do with my father um i'm not sure if he'll be if that's now just turned 70 so i'm not sure he he'll be he drinks a lot of wine like me, so I'm not sure he'll be fit enough to do it anymore. Um, but I like the dream of he and I doing at least maybe a week together and yeah. idea of taking a month off and whether I get to do the whole thing, but uh, a section of it would be fantastic. But I think those silver linings in that COVID is that I, know, I met now the love of my life and wife just after COVID, we got married. Oh, we were engaged after like seven weeks and married after about six months. So it's sort of there's a lot of silver linings to where covid leaves but it's i think that's the beauty of the pho- the photograph encapsulating those moments is that the photograph a month later would have been very different but that photograph captures the moment and the feel of harvest and when it finished so i think it's kind of yeah it's important at least to me anyway to sort of i don't often look back on things so i think it'll be nice to look back on as a little retrospective absolutely let's get into the story so you're championing an area of the wine world that has an extremely rich history. Um, people with at maybe a superficial level, you know, Australian wine, they immediately think of from a touristy perspective, you know, the Barossa down in Adelaide or something, whereas the Hunter is really, um, at least as I understand it, the birthplace of Australian wine. Um, Maurice O'Shea, people like that, Wine Hunter, f- terrific novel for people uh, wanting to maybe start getting an interest in the area. But you've come along, you're a you're a young winemaker and you've taken on that challenge and responsibility of, I guess, being an ambassador for that area. I'm wondering how far you can take me back um, in terms of the specific parcels, plots you're dealing with. So I understand we're going back before the world wars. Um, they were, they, it was a vineyard. It was reapplied for maybe primary fruit production or something during the war, but then thank God it was turned back into a vineyard. Can you give me a flavour of the history so, of what you're working uh, Where I'm sitting now is my family's property. I'm the second generation on this property. They didn't have a history in wine but just love, uh, love wine. So the history of the property is purely first and second. So we planted the vineyard on this property and I pulled out blocks, replanted things, and we're, this, is, this site is a little bit of fun work in progress. This is where our cellar is, the winery, mm-hmm. where my wife and I live. Somerset is what you're referring to as the vineyard we're talking about, which we've um, purchased almost a year ago now, which is really exciting. So this is where I was trained as a bit of culturalist. Glenn was actually looking after our vineyard uh, when I was at university. Um, and then through one, basically, conversation with him, I ended up starting work with him while I was at university. And in my holidays, I basically became full-time and uh, just love. I always grew up working in the vineyard, but with him, it was a sort of different approach. Like we were looking after two or 300 acres. It was very different to the, the 10 acres out the back that we had on the family estate. So that property itself and where I was trained and mentored under Glendon and his team was, was a, as far as I know it was a land grant um, done in the late 1800s um, and they were 
dairy farmers, which is what most of the Hunter Valley was. There was obviously a lot of viticulture and great growing up here, but most of that was for port production. They were, if you read The Wine Hunter, you'll learn a lot about the history of how arduous it was to actually get wine out of the place. And most of the wine was actually fortified. So they would take the long trip of the horse and buggy and fortify wines and take it by a barrel over to Morpeth. It would be put on a steamer um, and then taken down Hunt River and then um, it would end up in Sydney and then sold. And a lot of the wine was then, the only way it was, could survive the journey back to England was through fortification because we didn't really use sulfites back then. So the wines were very much raw. So they couldn't live, they couldn't survive the journey back to England. So Somerset began as yeah, dairy farming and then Ivan Glendon's father passed away last year as well, unfortunately, um, as did Glenn, which was very sad. So a lot of that history has gone with them, but we're still, we, they question what year it was actually planted, but sometime around 1890, the vineyard was planted. Um, they used to make some wine on site. The original um, shed is still there. Um, and there was some small winemaking equipment on site and they made some wine there in the early days. And then essentially where the vineyard is now, it's all now planted across the contours to prevent erosion. But in the original day, it was planted vertically up and down to allow horse and cart to plough the vineyards. All the original farm equipment is still in the shed, which is quite amazing. So they farmed the vineyard for about 50 years. And then unfortunately, during or around the end of the Second World War, Mid 40s, the vineyard was pulled up as basically there was no demand for grapes. And people were obviously very poor. Um, so they went back to dairy farming for about 20 years. And then in 1965, Ivan Glennon's father um, started replanting the vineyard. Um, and Glennon was a big part of that. So Glennon was, I think, from memory, born in same age as my dad in 51. So he was. Yeah, in his mid-teens, and so the vineyard it was always Glenn's legacy. It was sort of he cared about it more than, dare I say, his own life, um, and that's how important the vineyard was. So the replanting began in 65, 66 uh, with some, well, 65 is Semyon, 66 is Shiraz. There was 67 Shiraz, 68 Shiraz, 69 there's a lot of Semyon, 70s so are planted Shiraz again, and then through planting continued over the next 20 years up until even through the early 2000s um, they were pulling blocks out and replanting things but eventually they accumulated about 90 acres of vineyard there so at the moment what it's planted as is Semillon, Vidello, Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc and Gewürztraminer and Whites and the Reds uh, predominantly Shiraz with a little bit of Tempranillo. So in terms of where the vineyard has been in Isby, sorry, it has been um, it's always been in the same family for the last, I think, six or seven generations the current kids would be. So I feel very honoured to be looking after the, the place where I was far, sorry, where I was trained to grow grapes and where we farm now. Um, but the fruit over the last, at least the modern history, from, say, 65 onwards, they had a contract with Lindemans from about 65 to, I can't remember the exact year, but about the mid-'80s. And so a lot of those famous bin wines, um, Carl actually passed away, I think last week or the week before, which is very sad. He was the head winemaker of Lindemann's for a long time. Um, so the fruit went essentially exclusive to Lindemann's. So very famous site and a lot of those famous bin wines from there, uh, when that relationship ended, uh, they sold a lot of fruit to Len Evans. And if anyone doesn't know Len Evans, they should definitely jump on Wikipedia and start there because he is a very fascinating characteristic and he's one of the sole reasons why Australian wine exists in the place it does today. So really amazing uh, proponent, not very much for the Hunter Valley uh, where he lived. I actually got my gamay cuttings for our vineyard off his vineyard, which he planted called Loggerhead. So um, there's quite a big, little bit of gamay in the Hunter, but that's a different story. Um, but in terms of the history of the vineyard, yeah, it's gone from everyone to Lindemans to then obviously Rothbury when it was at its peak making the beautiful black labels, then over to Tower when Len was running that. Um, then in the modern context, the wine's been sold to guys like Matt Burton from Gundog who made some beautiful wines. Um, 
Mistletoe. Just trying to think who else. Um, Hunter. Tyrrell support. Shot like the list is endless in terms of modern hunter producers who've bought wine over the years. But it's nice to be able to say it's all ours now. So they mm. can't have it anymore. So <laughs> yeah. At, at this point in time, can you give me a um well, let's let's call it a, a crash course on the great varietals grown in the Hunter Valley? Extremely diverse. And I know that's a massive topic, but why I find it so interesting is the range. Um, you've got world class Shiraz, some people call it Syrah, Gewurz Tremina, uh, cool climate, or things that you would normally think are cool climate. Um, spoke to Bruce Tyrrell recently, and he was telling me they've got a history of producing some world class Pinot Noir. Um, you mentioned Gamay, and I've I think I read where you um, you sort of compared. Burgundy to the hunter in terms of, yeah, sure, cool climate region, but Burgundy gets warm. Whereas I think people normally think of the hunter as a relatively warm area. So it would be, it, it may surprise people when they hear, you know, Gamay, Pinot Noir. What, what's going on in the diversity? Oh, it really depends on the season. So last few years, we haven't had a single day. Over 40. No, sorry, I correct myself. There was one day in November of 2019, the 2020 season, that reached 41. So in the terms of context, you go, I can remember the weather. I can remember what happened. Those two years were very cool. We were in La Nina. The two years earlier, well, uh, well the four years earlier, should I say, four and a half, were end of it, or very much a series of drought years. I saw a day at 45. So... But there are years that it's great to grow one bridle and the years it's great to grow another. But I think each place across the world, like if you actually track a vintage chart of Australia or more specifically the Hunter Valley, you go, yeah, you usually have a series of four hot years or five years. You have a year or two of cooler weather and then a couple of other years that are half and half. And then you basically go on these big cyclical cycles. Global warming and climate change making this much harder, which is why we're trying to do our little part as a small producer. But those extremes are becoming worse and worse, which I think no one can argue with, nor they should anymore. Um, so in terms of the varietals we grow, I think it really depends on the season. But also, you look at Chardonnay, it's from Burgundy. It's planted in every region of the world. Burgundy is considered a cool climate. Like, it's fucking cold in over there in middle of winter and coming into spring have massive issues with frost that is makes burgundy marginal so people talk about marginality and all other climates but if you produce some great wine it's worth putting up with those marginal characteristics within those seasons this year we probably got a little bit too much rain mid-season but not late season so the guys who picked early the wines are fantastic the guys who try to push the ripeness probably not going to be very happy with their wines. So I think those marginal influences are, are true to every region of the world. Some places are too dry to grow grapes and make too much concentration. Like they get too ripe, they lack acidity. So I think every region has its own Achilles heel and those seasons, whether they're obviously wet, hot or dry, bring it out. Hunter Valley certainly has its issue with, <clears throat> excuse me, with rainfall, um, sometimes late season, but... To answer your question, like re referencing Burgundy, like we used to label our wines as Burgundy because our Shiraz was always soft, quite supple, still had lovely tannin, but they were labelled as Hunter River Burgundy, which was completely stupid and illegal, but the reference was there because the wines were obviously emblematic of what they were trying to replicate from those more Burgundian styles. There were also wines labelled as Hermitage. So if you had a cool year, you'd make Burgundy, and a warm year, you'd make Hermitage. It was kind of a... It's very funny to look at now, but like Brokenwood's labelled, their first couple of graveyards are labelled as Hermitage, as I recall. Um, there's plenty of very big producers, which are still going, who went along. Like you've got Shepherd's Riesling, you've got um, Ryan Moselle, or so Mo Moselle, well, Benny and Moselle, who was Semyon. Got nothing to do with Mosul, apart from the fact that they were trying to make a sweet Riesling, but it was made on Semillon. So there's all these funny wines that are part of Australia's idiosyncratic history of Australian wine that 
fortunately you now making wines which are around the hunter valley it's like they should be proud to call them hunter valley but i guess we're never going to ha have something that's called the hunter valley because you grow so many things and i think that's kind of the exciting part of the new world of making wine to go back i guess to the question that i think like, there's 2000 grape varietals or maybe three or five every thing you read or every person you talk to has a different answer but um i think different varietals can grow in different places very well so yeah i think it's exciting to be able to like, hunt Bay is the oldest pin in the wine in australia mm. it also has probably or not quite the oldest shiraz 1867 i think it's Tyrrell's uh and the bross has got 1851 which is lang mile um so there's Mass, this is such a plethora of historic vines here. When the French need cuttings, they come to Australia to get them. So, which is very much funny and ironic in all the best kind of ways. So, I think you got to have some experimentation in varietal. Like at the moment, we've just planted some Pinot Munia, Gamay, um, Avedra over the last few years. Um, Avedra we're using for rose because that's my favorite rose varietal. Um, Munia, we're year two no crop yet and the gamma is starting to produce its own crop and they seem to be making lovely light bright juicy reds which is what i want to drink which is i love beaujolais like not everything has to be structured and full-bodied when it's 40 degrees outside and you're sick of rosé which i'm not sure is an actual thing but you need to go a little bit heavier um then a light red that can go in an ice bucket those wines are perfect for what i want to make in the hunter valley so i think maybe they're cool climate varietals but don't plant on the western slope of an open vineyard. Our plant, our vineyard's planted next to an avenue of trees that are about 50 metres tall. 30 metres away, so the roots can't affect them, but enough so they get shielded by the afternoon sun and they don't get baked. So it's about choosing the right clone or the right varietal for the right site. Love it. Okay. Let's get stuck into your story. So I understand <laughs> your, your, your mum and your dad were pretty pivotal in setting you up. Um, to being, I guess, the, the winemaker you are today. But you've already referenced it was more of a hobby hobby farm. Um, they set up a restaurant. They were obviously... Yeah, had, um, had a little... Dad got obsessed with cooking for about a decade. Um, I mean, the first time Dad cooked, we were playing soccer. So we were, I used to play... I played soccer before I played rugby because I wasn't allowed to play contact sports until I was about double digits. So... I remember coming home from soccer and dad and I used to go through this amazing cookbook called Sizzle. If you can find it, it's like the first great Australian barbecue cookbook. It's really, I've still got a copy. It's very good. I don't want to give back to dad. He keeps asking for it actually. Um, but we basically started cooking stir fries and Baron Mundy and things. You know, we had one of those you butte barbecues about 20 years ago, which had a little wok thing on the side of it, which is very, very very in vogue at the time but um we started every saturday after saturday after soccer we'd come home and cook on the barbecue and that obsession for food then became into a little restaurant and a little bistro that they had and they had a nice little cult following and it was sort of it was great it was super fun it was just bio and that's what mum and dad sort of did plus the wine on the side obviously as well but dad's a very very successful lawyer and mum did a fantastic job of running the business while she raised three um, children, which I think is probably harder than I know because I don't have any kids. So <laughs> I know yeah. what it's like as a kid. Um, so I think in terms of where that was, that sort of context of the property. Um, so mum and dad, yeah, sort of made wine on weekends on the side. And then, yeah, I, I, they didn't ever implore me to to follow into wine as for them, obviously it always been a hobby and obviously more of something which never made any money. So why would you uh, instill the, your first one to uh, go into making wine? So I didn't, I started engineering as a school. I was good at maths and engineering and physics and absolutely hated it. So I quit within six weeks and did two snow seasons and came home and decided to come back and still love it process of architecture and design mm -hmm. and construction. I did uh, two degrees in architecture. Um, and then a recent point, I think halfway through my, after I finished my bachelor and while I was traveling, I got 
this very crazy award. I won the best graduate from every single university in New South Wales, from all the universities for that undergraduate degree for a project I designed. And so I got a heap of prize it? money. But it was ridiculous. I didn't, couldn't believe it. I was in a hostel in France, hung over as fuck, and the lady from the Australian Institute of Architecture was calling me going, um, can you be in um, Potts Point <laughs> in about a week's time and bring your project down? And I was like, definitely not. I mean, I'm in Lille in France and I'm uh, about to go to Beaujolais. So um, I called my dad and he went down and went to the awards ceremony and he thought it was uh, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So he got changed out of his suit from the office, being a lawyer and rocks up in a jeans and a button up. And he's on stage, all these other young architects receiving the award from me. And he's like, oh, I didn't realize it was so serious. And I was like, I had no idea, mate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but sort of went from that, which was maybe a, at some point in my life, a very promising career ahead. And I did work for a very amazing firm that if you like architecture, some really amazing young guys in Newcastle called Curious Practice. Um, I was their first ever employee and they're now doing some amazing things. They've just designed my house. Um, wow. They're amazingly talented. They're saying the year before they won the award for best graduates of every university, but in the master's degree. So it was, yeah, it was very much to, to mum and dad's disdain that after all that time at university, I went, I don't really think I want to sit in an office and be an architect. I think I want to well, be a wine maker. And then well, so I started. Yeah. And yeah. so then I, um, I was still working for the boys and I was working for Glenn full time. I, I don't know how I did it. I was doing a master's of viticulture diploma at TAFE, which is a couple of years working for Glenn, doing Celador here. And then I think, I don't know. but there was a lot of things. I didn't have much of a life for a long time, but um, I think it's paying off now, I guess. Um, but yeah, so I went from that to then the first vintage. I bought my, my first fruit off Glenn. Um, separate mum and dad I paid for it it wasn't done through the business I said Glenn I want you to sell me a couple of tons of fruit so he, he bought oh, he gave me about one point oh, we know maybe two tons of Simeon and it may end up being about it was maybe about one ton of Shiraz but another grower pulled out no names mentioned but he didn't get the fruit after that I took the fruit and we made some really nice wine um and I think the, I guess I, the one bug really bit that, but I just love growing and I love producing something out of it. Like we had a half acre veggie patch and got an orchard behind where I'm sitting now that I pulled out to build a storage shed because I couldn't manage it anymore. But that the process of growing up in gardens and grounds and growing everything from a hedge to everything else was really embed, embedded in me. So I just loved that and then I went from there to I can't remember what we probably doubled it and or maybe tripled it in 16 and 17. By the time we got to 20, 2018, we probably had 30 tons, then 19, or it must be 40 or 50, then about 20 we reached about was what should have been about 80 tons, but with the drought and um bushfires, then about 60. And then this year we've now got uh, almost 100 tons off the vineyard, so it's sort of been a pretty crazy roller coaster ride um, yeah but uh, it's been super rewarding yeah i don't know some days i go back fuck how do we even well how am i here from 2015 but it's sort of well 14 when i started working with glenn guys it's, it's yeah this is vintage number eight and uh, well there's okay. more time but i've never been happier yeah couple of things I want to unpack. So I'm going to sort of take a big step backwards, just, just going back to your childhood. So a lot of culinary influence there. Um, right to assume that wine, was wine just an infused part of you growing up? Like if I just look at my own childhood, you know, I'm not a winemaker, but I think my passion for wine was because wine was part and parcel of my childhood. There was always an open bottle um the conversation the trash talking was always within the context of an open bottle of wine made it better made it happier i kind of associate that with a lot of happy memories and i think if, if i look at the project i'm working on now 
that was a massive influence on that. Um, there are so many happy memories I've got that I've, I, I can't help but sort of tie into wine. I'm not going to say it was all wine, but I think wine to me is happiness, memories, nostalgia, certain figures who have had an influence on me. A um, little bit of what sort of impact going back to that way. Being, that have you. What I'm doing now, if it wasn't for my parents, both yeah. mum and dad, that wine was always a part of what we did. Um, oh, no, mum was an early childhood teacher who ran childcare centres in the cross in the 80s and did amazing things down there. And dad came from a very interesting background, but got a scholarship through Rotary to be a lawyer. And then he had his epiphany wine sometime. I think it was a, a story goes, it was an article Clark looking at cause and his boss at the time poured him a Chardonnay. And I think he, he told me that he was working three jobs at the time uh, um, and he was pumping gas on Sundays just to make rent because they paid him absolutely fucking nothing at this major law firm, even though I was working there 60 hours a week. So he had to go pump gas on the weekends. But his boss did one favour that he taught him, love a great wine. He just had this class at a restaurant one day and he just went, wow, what the fuck is this? And the wine bug was a bit, I guess it's one of those epiphany wines. Like I have mine. Um, but for that bug, mum love, it took my dad 15 years before she found, before he found a, a wine, a red wine that mum loved. But that wine was always in the house. At the age of five, my sister has amazing sense of smell who actually doesn't drink anymore, but unless it's pretty much by far or Cullen, they're the only two things she likes drinking, um, i.e. expensive Chardonnay oh. from very good producers. I'm trying to wean her onto mine, which is kind of funny. But um, <laughs> um she doesn't drink. So at the age of five, she, you could line up a Simeon, Modelo, a Chardonnay, and a Savion Blanc. She wouldn't taste them. She could just tell you what they were via aromatics. So one was always on the table. It was always a conversation. It was drunk most days. Um, obviously, we're living on a vineyard. It was in its early stages, but there were vines going in. One year, Dad often said, you can have two, you can have one thing this year. Either we go on a ski holiday or we pay someone to prune the vineyard. But if we pay someone to prune the vineyard, because I can't do it, I don't have time, and I'm, you guys have to do it. So the first week of our school holidays, we prune the vineyard so we got to save the money so we can go have a ski holiday. So there's lots of fun anecdotes of yeah. being a small producer and growing up and those little bits and pieces. Um, yeah, Dad paid my schoolmates and I oh, to prune the vineyard one year. It took two years to recover. I think we were so drunk every morning after the week we did it that it took the vineyard two years to recover. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So the boys know who they are. Um. <laughs> okay. What do you get up to in your spare time? You're obviously, you're an outdoors guy. You love projects. You like tilling the soil. I've heard snow season. What what does Angus Finden do when he's not making world-class wines? Oh, I think the last six years has actually been hard to get a day off. So, um, or seven years. So, if it was just me in my own time, go surfing. Mm -hmm. um, got quite a few miles. I just love surfing, crazy point breaks, the pass, um, and seal rocks are probably my two favorite breaks that are just really fun. Uh, or at Crescent Head, go to Lennox, just surf the point and just relax because. There's no phone. And for anyone who runs a small business, there's, when you actually don't have your phone on you, it's quite amazing. So you can actually disconnect and you've got time to think and relax. So, yeah, surfing is probably my favourite pastime. Um, love music. We've got a massive record collection, the sell it all. So music's a big part of Hannah and I's household. Um, we're always arguing over what we're listening to. Um, and then, yeah, we've got huge vinyl collection. So I love listening to vinyls. I think they're probably the two things I love doing, but yeah, walking trails and treks is something I would like to do more, but trying to get more than a week off at the time has been rather tricky the last couple of years. But one of my best mates has just started 
fly fishing a lot. And so we've started, uh, he's taken me on a couple of times to a couple of hikes, went up to the snowies and we did a, you know, a couple of K hike in down about a thousand meters, fish, fly fished up river for a day, then hike back out and full white is. And that was, it was great. Have a couple of beers, catch some fish, go home, cook them. Like, I think that's, that's living. That's about it. But my others love eating and drinking. So that's about as good as pastime as anyone. So. Yep. Okay. And again, the context for that question is because, I mean, throughout the course of this conversation, um, we've, yeah, we've referred to really difficult times that you would have gone through, especially in the recent past three years. Small business, never easy. Um, I guess at this point, I want to touch on what have been the challenges that you've had to overcome to get to the stage that you're at, and what have been the, there may not be one high point, um, but what is it about this product that makes it all worth it to you? I mean, you're obviously extremely passionate about it, you've got so many stories, um, memories, et cetera. But but why wine? Why wine? But are there three questions in that, or do you just want me to answer the last part of the question? It's normally, how I ask a question, and I normally get those sorts of responses. People go, "That was not one question. That was a number of questions." Yeah, you've been there. watching Smartlist. Have you ever uh, listened to the podcast Smartless? No. <laughs> You sound like Jason Bateman asking a question, but it goes on for about thirty seconds, and they go, "So, what did you just ask me?" <laughs> <laughs> so all right um the hardest part of running a small business yep. is balance um for me i'm a workaholic and i have been since i was oh, pre 16 i started chopping wood they do 12 um to make i love working working is part of my i guess my own well-being um as i love achieving things so balance to me is the hardest part is about switching off and leaving the vineyard. Uh, we've now got an amazing team around us that for the first time I'm actually starting to feel comfortable to do that. Um, but yeah, taking time away from the place is really hard uh, for me to switch off. That's probably the hardest part mm-hmm. around the vineyard. What was part two? General challenges. So you've taken a hobby wine farm if you want to call it that, and you've turned it into a relatively successful, or we'll call it a very successful commercial enterprise with a very good reputation. You made it sound quite, when we were just, I guess, going over the history, quite line and length, but I'm sure it wasn't that easy. What are the challenges that you've had to overcome? I mean, you got COVID, you've had the bushfires, to name a few. Yeah, the last, eight, last two years have been... Forgetting growing pains of any small business and trying to figure out how to fit wine in the winery when you couldn't afford to buy tanks or any press. And mm-hmm. the, one of the hardest I remember is that we picked, oh, it would have been 20, maybe the 2019 Chardonnay from Somerset. And we were expecting about to pick three tons, but the weather changed and we had to pick all the Chardonnay off the whole vineyard the same day. And we had, the only press we had was a half ton basket press. So it took us two days to press all the Chardonnay off. Like there were massive growing pains. We've now got the bag press and other things. But there's those days and times where you just go, oh, fuck. there were some very long, <laughs> painful days. Yeah. 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 Growing pains are a massive part of it. I mean, the last few years have probably been the most challenging, more than any other, in the sense that from bushfires and then COVID part one, which was two to three months, then COVID part two for us up here. Um, was about four months. So for the better part of almost two years, our business was closed for eight months. So that means we've got accommodation on site, accommodation is closed, cell door was closed. But the bigger issue is that there was very little export. We don't export much, but there were no restaurant bar sales, which is a big part of our business. So distribution to Sydney and Brisbane, all those places we love dining out, they were closed. So basically every avenue of income we had for whatever that is that literally a third of the last two years have been closed that's been the most stressful right and that's something you can't plan for as a business um that was probably the biggest stress but i think in terms of other things everything else is adaptive like i mean you got shortages of staff you find new ones and you find people that really fit and want to work here but we've now got an amazing team 
the two of the full-time guys who work at Somerset, they work for Glendon. Glendon trained one of my guys, Dale, as a kid 30 years ago. So Glenn trained him, he trained me, and now Glenn Dale's back here working for me on the same vineyard. And that passion for the vineyard that was instilled by Glenn into Dale is still there, and he's proud of the place we work and we want to improve it. And mm-hmm. Shaz or Sharon, um, it's done the same thing. She's been there for Glenn for almost 15 years and then now working for me. I think it's fantastic. So I think there's something about that site and hopefully our culture of a small business. And it's, I don't know. I think yeah, finding the right people is, is hard, but when you find them and we've got an amazing team, Ika, Jeremy, um, Hardy, Shaz, Dale, I'm going to forget someone. I'll be in trouble tomorrow. Um, but I think the guys really, really enjoy us. I think finding that staff that really fit the mold of what we what we do and our philosophies around farming and winemaking and basically viticulture itself, that's probably one of the hardest things. But when you have that, yeah, I really want to hold on to it. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you about Glenn? Obviously yes. somebody who you're, you were extremely close to. Um, he was a mentor. He had a massive influence on you as a person and as the winemaker you are today. Um, can you give a little bit of a backstory for myself and the listeners who he was, a little bit about your relationship um, and why? I mean, he's obviously had a massive impact on you. So can you speak to that issue a little bit? Glenn was really hard, not to me. Oh, he was strict and he taught me. It was the right way and the wrong way. But for a long time, yeah, he was, I've heard anecdotes and stories over the last, of people speaking about Glenn over his timing, but he was not an easy man to deal with for a long time. He was very, um, of a certain way. Um, and I certainly saw that with him from time to time. But I like to think I softened him a little bit. Um, gave him a little bit of confidence in winemakers again that I know Glenn had grown up on land he farmed vineyards for his whole life and looked after other people like he was a very much a hard worker and I think we very much bonded over that we dare I say simply put we, we gave a shit like we wouldn't ever leave the vineyard with something half done it's like if it meant like I've seen guys walk out of the vineyard, there's one poster of place, then there's a row, but if it's 301 or 259, when they lock up, knock up at three, they'll they'll finish. It's like, it's like, just do the last post. It's one minute. I'll just finish it. Like, come on, let's, let's want that satisfaction of the job. So I think we both bonded early over the, and I love doing something well and the passion and interest that I took in, not only great growing, but him and the family and, the site itself. Um, so sort of, yeah, I definitely took me under his wing and that relationship grew was in the early days. I said, oh, as I mentioned before, he was like, oh, will you sell me a ton of grapes? And he was a bit reluctant. Like, who's this 25-year-old or 24-year-old? Who's this kid trying to buy grapes off me? And I've got big vineyards around me. Um, but after a couple of years, I started buying more and I was selling and and like everyone else in the region, I said, I'll pay more money. Like, I know how much goes into growing this. Everyone else is underpaying you. Like, he was being absolutely shafted by big businesses and big names around the valley where I was just going, there's no way these guys are paying enough money for the fruit they're growing. Like, I see how much work goes into it. And people still aren't in Hunter Valley aren't paying enough money for fruit, which is why I would never sell it because, I mean... They're selling wines for sixty dollars a bottle, and I won't say how much they were paying, but it's a sweet fuck all. And so, growers have been shafted for a long period of time. Like this, they were getting the same money they were in nineteen eighty for their grapes, roughly as they were in two thousand and fifteen. The prices hadn't gone up, but everything else had. So mm. the growers had the, I don't know, they were literally being ripped off by by winemakers and vineyards and I was like this has got to stop so every year I said mate we'll pay more you just tell me what you want from the fruit and we'll just put a structure in and we'll figure it out it's all factored in the bottle cost and we'll make some wines together and we'll start with that 
and that was the handshake agreement we did in the first vintage. And from that, we followed that through to the end. And from there, it started a, yeah, a very much a lifelong, well, our lifelong was a 10 plus year relationship we had, but he went from selling to very big companies to just us and he dropped them all by the way. Like some of my favorite memories of the last 10 years of my life, uh, he, Rose and I, his wife sitting down, we'd have dinner once a month, just the three of us. Like it was, yeah, he was like a second father to me and he always described our relationship as like having a, a second son and I, how much Jason meant to him. And Jason worked in on that vineyard and for, um, for Lindemans for a long time um, and he no longer wanted to continue with vineyards, which is why when Glenn asked him, would you want to take it over, he said no and said, I was the second port of call apart from blood. So that relationship and that understanding of, of what goes into growing a bunch of grapes, particularly for people who care is, yeah, it's a lot more than a couple of thousand dollars a kilo or less than that than what some people pay. So, um, yeah, I think it was a level of mutual respect, a mutual love and a mutual adoration of I don't know, the toil and, the wanting to do things better every year. Yep. That's beautiful. Um, and you've, you've hit on something there because going back to that question that I asked that got mixed up in the hullabaloo of questions that I asked you. I on, got two actually, parts of it. There was, I think there was three or four parts to it, to be completely fair. One of them, um, the, the question I'm going to revisit now is that love of wine. Why? And, you know, there's all these people might think they're kind of, wankery sayings of oh you know time capsule place terroir which are all true and there's really there's a lot of depth right. of meaning to those things right four parts who doesn't love getting pissed that's super fun and when it tastes delicious that's even better yeah so when you have a wine that changes your life it literally changes your life and i had that in burgundy with uh, a beautiful lady called Sophie, and we were, we dated for years throughout early um, naughty, not naughties, early twenties, and we went to Burgundy at my behest, and I had a bottle of I think, 2001 Cawthorn Bressonard, you know, from a little subregion in Burgundy, mm-hmm. and that wine, having it, we we're like two young kids and walking the cellar door, like we're being 23. Like we're in a Grand Cru um, little appellation in Burgundy in a cellar door and not wanting how much we can actually afford to spend on the tasting. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're going to buy some wine. And they're like, oh, try this and try this. Like, and plus my family has a small vineyard. They're like, oh, then all of a sudden you're not just a young kid that became, it was this pommy couple. He was wearing a Newcastle United jersey um, in the tasting room. He drive down to this vineyard and load his case up with, um, Corton, no, it was not. No, Lox Corton um, Chardonnay, which is a very rare section of Corton. Um, but he'd load that up. We were having these Chardonnay, it's amazing. And then we had this bottle of Pinot, and I just tasted it in that little tasting room. And it just like struck a nerve. And I didn't know if I realized it right at that moment. But then we went back to our little um, place we were staying, and we had the bottle. And we drank this bottle of that I won. And I bought two bottles. And at that time, it was like, would have been a week's wages for me or something. Um, I bought one home for dad. And I had the other one with Sophie that night. And yeah, I called mum and dad pissed. Like we decided then open the, we had the Grand Cru, then we had a Premier Cru, then we drank the Village Wine. So we drank in the right order, like as the Dowett spiral. But I said, I called dad and I was like, dad, I get it. And that was sort of, it so that was sort of you have that epiphany wine. It's like when you try those things, like, I want to make something that makes someone else have that moment about wine. That that that's and that's exactly it. And that was sorry, just so people don't think it was entirely random. There was a connection between my questions with Glenn and the follow up question because to I'm my keep going. Yeah. my my love of wine it comes from the moments that it's created. So sure, there's the geography, the culture, all the complexity that goes into that, but. I've had so many moments of depth, happiness, you could even call it romance, um, where there've just been these really, really, really special moments 
that have kind of been, I think, made by a really strange liquid in a glass. Yeah, I think forget all the fun and other bits and pieces, but I guess to continue on from that light bulb moment and wanting to create that, Glenn and Dad definitely had different um, takes on those influences. And even Mum, um, can't, can't forget your mum. But like those wines we had around the dinner table were always interesting, but it was Dad's love of wine that brought us up here um, and Mum's love of wine sort of issued after that. Yeah, we still... Dad sent me a photo the other night. He was with these two of his oldest friends and he was drinking a bottle of 65 Barolo. And I was like, what? Why aren't you sharing this with me? Then he had it. <laughs> He's like, They're not mine. No, no. <laughs> but it's like those wines, I'm like, and he was saying it was one of the best wines he's had in maybe 20 years. Yeah. Like in those moments, I can still, he will think about that wine with Edgar and Enzo, who he enjoyed it with for the next five or 10 years. And they will probably talk about that wine for such a long period of time. And that was very amazing to us as kids on our birth years. He bought us a bottle of Grange every year. It was amazing to try those artifacts, like yeah. when you're 21 and 25, like they were beautiful time pieces of what they were. So that love of wine was always instilled through Dad. What Glenn instilled was a different love of wine, which is more of a love of the Hunter Valley. I always loved the Hunter because I'd grown up here. And I loved old Samuel because dad would pull them down my neck every chance he got. But I instilled a different love and more love of being you know, an understanding of sight and place and the wines that that site makes. And I think a lot of winemakers have tried to make different wines off Somerset and hadn't understood the site itself. And that site doesn't make rich, full-bodied wines. It makes wines to light to medium-bodied. They're intense, full-flavoured. They have great body, great length, but... They're all around that 12 and a half to maybe 13, 13.5% alcohol. They were picked earlier. Um, the site doesn't want to be picked like, like it has full flavor intensity at such a lower alcohol. And it, he instilled the love of the hunter in me. He instilled the love of Hunter of Burgundy. And the wines I make now are very much a testament to, to Glenn and what he very much taught me about that place. And making wines that truly reflect so truly reflect a place and a site. And that site is not only the Hunter, it's not only the cold one to be more specific, but it's that section of Somerset, the original parish, which is our little section. So the wines that we make from there are like no other. So why are we trying to make it look like somewhere else? So for me, I, don't know, I still poo-poo most other winemakers who bring fruit in from other areas. I think when you go to Burgundy, you drink Burgundy, you don't see them bringing in Bordeaux. Maybe the, the Baudelaire's hate the Burgundians, but that's probably a different conversation. But it doesn't mean they still can't appreciate each other's wines. So for me, if you're in Macedon, make wines in Macedon. If you're in Mornington, make wines in Mornington. If you're in the Tamar Valley, make wines in the Tamar. If you're in Marg River, be proud of the wines you make. And if you're in Hyder Valley, love the wines you make in the Marg River. Like farm your vineyards choose a source and make that a life journey. Don't fucking pull bits and pieces from here and there. Like, oh, I want to make a Pinot Puccio from here and a Chardonnay from here and a Pinot from here and a Pinot Mew from here. It's like, well, go form a relationship with a grower. Buy a vineyard. Like, I know it's not easy. Like, I've spent seven days a week the last 10 years doing it. And like, I think you need to be proud of what you do when the place you grow and make and make wine that the Hunter Valley is the oldest wine region in Australia. And we need to see more wines that are purely Hunter Valley and less sell doors. That's a lot of things. So I think it's exciting that there's now a younger crop of winemakers coming through that are actually proud to be from the Hunter and they sell wines purely from the Hunter. So if you want to taste big, rich wines, go to the Brosser, go to McLaren, Heathcote, Langhorn Creek, McLaren Vale. They do it so well. I love drinking them. Wait, would I have fun making them? Sure. But I love making wines for the hunter because that's what I was brought up doing and it's what I'm passionate about. So I think it's time for, I don't know, a revolution of the younger generation to come up and stand up and say, yeah, we're proud to be from the hunter. Love it. I'm going to ask you one more question. I promise this is going to be it. And it's going to be one question. 
tips on young people who are venturing into the wine scene are general wine education. So how to take a glass. So not people trying to get into winemaking, but people no, who are starting no. to drink wine. People who know nothing about wine or have a very, you know, basic knowledge, wanting to enhance that knowledge, enhance that experience. So maybe one day they have that moment you described having the the court on, you know, you, you drink that thing and it just blows your mind. Is that something you can prep yourself for or do you, do you just have to wait? Um, not and, everyone has those wine moments, but I think to me, find yourself a buddy, like a buddy system, like in preschool. Like if you really want to get into wine, everyone's got a mate who likes wine. Start drinking with them. Like they will, if they're anything like myself and my mates, we'll always be opening more things. There'll always be a night where we'll try a couple of things. Surround yourself with people who like wine and want to try wine. That for me is the simplest thing. But if you don't have a mate like who likes wine, if you're in a city, go to a wine bar. Sit, go sit down in the bar. Don't sit at a table. Sit at the bar and talk. A small place like, say, so love Tilly Divine or Monopole. Sit at the bar and talk with someone. Say, I'm new to wine. I want to have a conversation. Um, I'm interested in wine. Can you take me on a journey? They'll probably pull you a series of five or six half glasses because they will be happy to do that. They won't do it for the normal root guy up the back or the guy in the suit that's being an absolute arrogant asshole. But if you show a bit of effort and you're interested in what you're talking about, most people will be really thrilled to actually spark someone else's wine journey. To us, hospitality, the essence of hospitality is to be hospitable. And that's what true hospitality is. And most great venues have great staff. So there's a thousand venues in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, every capital city, and even small places that people really want to take you there because they wouldn't be doing their job and working those places if they didn't care about what they're doing. So go find your own little wine bar. Start start with that. Find people around you who like wine and good culture. And all of a sudden you'll be hooked. Love it. Great advice. Advice I'm I'm trying to adopt and implement every single day. And I just have so much fun doing it. And every once in a while I get to have great experiences like talking to people like yourself. So Angus Finden, it's been awesome sitting here talking with you. Really, really appreciate it. Love the stories, love the passion you have for the project. Um, and can't wait to get my hands on some of your stuff in the short to medium term future. Knock it open, knock it down. Thanks, mate. Love to have uh, spent the evening with you. So cheers. Really appreciate it. Awesome.